Hello all, I'm Kel Kidman and welcome to Breaking on the Daily and first let's address the new lighting situation. I'm trying this out for now. I realize that my videos were a bit too bright before though I don't know if this is going to end up perfectly. I might have to add a few things for my face though. We'll get to that uh, or you know we'll see how that works out. Yeah, I'm just trying it out for now but that's the update on the production. So Let's actually get into the stories, where today we actually begin with a bit of an update on the slow death of journalism. Because you see, the border crisis that has been occurring in the U.S. over uh, this past few weeks or month at this point has really highlighted the utter lack of media coverage about Biden, and actually proper media coverage about Biden, because many, many uh, examples have been proffered up to this point about Biden being one of the least transparent presidents in history. And this is just another example of such because the media, uh, the media has been blocked out from having essentially any access to the border over this entire time. The, Jen Psaki was coming around saying, oh, no, no, we'll figure out how we can do that eventually, and, you know, once the conditions stop looking so terrible. And by the way, we'll get to that because there are pictures still floating around, though uh, they didn't come from any official sources. They are, the, however, floating around. And this has ruffled the jimmies of many a, a traditional journalist with people like, oh... Oh, I don't know, a John Moore asking U.S. Customs and Border Control to stop blocking media access to their border operations. I have photographed CBP under Bush, Obama, and Trump, but now zero access granted to the media. This is a common aspect among many of the media because there has been a full blackout on any actual information from this, bo any border facility or anything that's going on on the border. Because the Biden administration doesn't want anyone to know about it. And they really, really don't. Because they, they're not only uh, limiting the access to the border, but they're also uh, limiting access to Biden himself. Of course, the White House has done many lids over uh, uh, the entirety of his campaign, as well as even into his presidency. And I think it was just today where they called a lid at 1.13 p.m. And this is not to have Biden do extra work in the background, though there may be some of that. We already know from CNN fluff pieces that Biden was going to bed at like, oh, I don't know, 7 p.m. It's been a while since I've actually looked at that story, but it was pretty early. And he would go home and just hang out rather than actually doing anything presidential. Uh, nothing is being done in the Biden administration. He is doing almost nothing. Resident Biden is doing almost nothing. And that same goes for the journalists. Well, all of them except what I want to call the new journalists, of which there is only one or two organizations at this point, but the most prolific exemplar of would be Project Veritas. Because you see how there is that media blackout of all information about the border and how no one could get any pictures and any pictures that have been taken had to be taken from the Mexico side of the border rather than the U.S. side? Well, <laughs> uh, the same doesn't apply to James O'Keefe because James O'Keefe had pictures of the inside of these border facilities, and man, some of these pictures are just kind of sad, frankly, because many of these pictures are show uh, these pictures are showing things like many migrants being wrapped up like burritos in tin foil. Uh, that was a funny comment I saw under these uh, uh, the release of these photos. It is it is absurd. It is infinitely worse than the 2015 photos that got uh, mangled into being 2017 photos somehow back when the kids in cages story originally came out it, it is so much worse than that and these people have supposedly at least been there for 10 to 11 days at this point there have been many people that have been stuck in these facilities and there's been a massive massive amount of people in these facilities this wouldn't be as much of a problem if, say, mm, I don't know, Trump was still in office and all of these people were sent back over to, the, over to Mexico because we were still, you know, at least slightly enforcing our border, 
But the question here really is, rather than the border stuff, which of course is important, but is not the topic of this particular segment, is not what's happening at the border, but rather, how didn't any journalists, other than James O'Keefe, get these photos? Because in all likelihood, these photos are coming from a CBP agent or someone who was working at these facilities. This, in all likelihood, was coming from a leak. This is a leak. And let me ask you, are you telling me that this leaker didn't go to the New York Times? That it, this leaker didn't go to the Washington Post? To any of these leftist, mainstream, supposedly journalistic outlets? Are you telling me that didn't happen? If so, why? Well, we all know why at this point. It's because these outlets no longer do journalism. They don't do anything that would constitute journalism. Of course, I'm not claiming I do either. I'm a political commentator. I do not do journalism. The most I do is aggregate stories and then talk about them and give my perspective on that. That's all I do. But James O'Keefe, especially in this situation, is the journalist. The New York Times is not the journalistic outlet. The Washington Post certainly isn't with their anonymous sources who are all stuck in the establishment, in the institutions rather than people who are actually leaking things which are bad for the institutions. You have people leaking things about anti-establishment people, mostly when it comes to anonymous sources in terms of uh, New York Times on anonymous sources or Washington Post anonymous sources. No, James O'Keefe is getting many anonymous sources who are actually exposing problems that are occurring in these institutions, in these establishment areas. He is exposing many of these things. He's actually doing journalism. Old journalism, these old institutions, are dead. Some people would have you believe that the reason they aren't doing journalism or they aren't covering these things is by and large because they don't feel the need to and that they still have the exact same amount of push and pull on the American public's mind as they used to. Now, am I saying they have none? Well, that's obviously not true. Just look at uh, how overestimated people get about the actual risk of COVID for ample evidence that the mainstream media still has at least a modicum uh, or a, a large modicum of uh, influence over the American mind. But it is lessening because these people are not doing journalism anymore. And the reason they're not doing journalism anymore is because the people who would normally be leaking these photos to the New York Times or any of these disgruntled journalists who can't get into the places, it's not as though they don't want to cover this story. They're simply unable to because they don't have access to it directly and they can't do it through their reporters and all the leakers, all the people who actually want to get this stuff out there isn't going to them anymore because they know journalism is not done at the New York Times. They know journalism is not done at the Washington Post. They know it's being done at Project Veritas and organizations like it. That's what they know. And that is something to keep in mind going forward. And you really do need that. But speaking of things that also need to be kept in mind going forward, the Russia-China alliance, or at least tentatively so, is something which has been over, uh, going into overdrive as of recent. Once again, with regard to the Biden administration, it seems to me that this is at least majority caused by the Biden administration and their policies. You see... The uh, story that actually spurred on this segment is a story about China, uh, Russia urging China to ditch US, the U.S. dollar in uh, essentially a bid to bust sanctions. Their idea is, is that, well, we don't like the U.S. sanctions us and prevents us from doing these things, and so we want to move away from the dollar and not have to deal with the U.S. dollar, and when we do that, we will no longer have to deal with U.S. sanctions, or at least not to the same extent, because the U.S. dollar is a large proportion of how U.S. sanctions get enforced. And this seems, well, seems a bit like a bluff to me, frankly. This is following almost immediately after multiple humiliating inci incidents over the last week with regard to Biden's foreign policy, whether that be the China summit that happened in Anchorage, where the China was insulting the Biden administration directly to their faces and was uh, 
complaining about them for mortal moralizing and frankly coming at it at it from a much better position than the biden administration was since they uh, since the biden administration seems to be coming at it from a much more uh positive to china look than even i uh, was thinking they would and you also have the uh <laughs> putin debate me bro example where putin was asking biden to debate because he was also kind of humiliating Biden and because Biden was calling Putin a killer and whatnot. And it, there has just been a massive foreign policy train wreck in this case. But I'm going to explain why I think this is a bluff. And the reason I think it's a bluff is because, well, take a look at what China says whenever this exact sort of thing is proposed from the opposite side. Whenever someone on the American side, say Donald Trump or anyone like it, anyone on the right of any sort of prominence, proposes something like decoupling, proposes moving America's f manufacturing from China, not necessarily to the U.S. or native side, or U.S. side, state side, but maybe to India or literally just any other country that is in China. Look at what happens when they do that. China suddenly starts being really tentative about that and starts saying, well, don't be ridiculous. That sh that's nonsense. You're going to only hurt yourself if you do that. And da -da 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 -da. All this blustering that they do. And I still hold on to the theory. And, uh, well, it's not really a theory so much as it is looking at history, acknowledging the patterns within, and then applying it to now, that China and all of their economic numbers are essentially fake. You see... This comes at from the basic premise that you cannot measure economic numbers in communist countries because simply they can manipulate any numbers they want into being whatever they want. And so long as there is no foreign verification of such, so things like exporting numbers, that sort of stuff they can't fake. Importation numbers, what they are actually importing into their country, those, that stuff can't be fake. All right, because that's all verified by either the U.S. or whatever other country is being done with it, uh, or, or or is you know benefiting or whatnot. But any numbers that are happening in China, otherwise known as their actual domestic product, any sort of domestic consumption they have, anything to that extent, cannot be verified. You cannot verify whether people in China actually have jobs. You cannot verify whether people in China are actually consuming as much product as is being said by the Chinese, you cannot even verify if the things which are being imported are being used at all, because China very much acts the same way the Soviet Union did with the Iron Curtain. All of that sort of stuff was kept under lock and key, and whatever uh, statistics they were putting out, it was sure to be absolutely scraped of all bad indicators for their economy. This has been the case in, the China, in China's economy for a very long time. It's essentially a form of economic stilts that they've been doing. If China was to decouple from the U.S. dollar and thus decouple itself from much of U.S. investment uh, at, in the same step, what would end up happening is they would no longer have U.S. money, U.S. billionaire money, flowing into their coffers. And when that stops happening, their economy would go bust. That's the fact of the matter. So the idea that this is being proposed seems to me a a uh, slap at Biden because they know they're not going to do anything about it. And even if nothing gets done or they don't even try to do this sort of thing, it still works as a bargaining chip against Biden since he's not even going to question this. If say Trump was in, a, involved, he would say he would in all likelihood say, "Good, we don't want to deal with you. Go away. All right." If you want to not deal with our sanctions, okay, we'll move our manufacturing elsewhere. That's what Trump would do. Of course, Biden's not going to do that because his foreign policy is, in fact, a mess. All right. Moving on, though, uh, to our third story. And, well, this isn't actually a story. It's more just a topic because I didn't really have a particular story to attach this to. Rather, I wanted to talk about social media and the kind of quagmire that we're in because there has been a lot of confusion about what the strategy should be going forward with regard to social media and what that strategy should be and I want to preface, preface this that eh, most of what you're doing is probably fine I'm not someone who's going to 
bag on you for being on big tech platforms or anything like that. But I have some suggestions for many people, especially people who aren't on alt tech platforms or who aren't on alternative platforms, period. I have some suggestions for you. Now, there are generally three uh, forms of thought when it comes to using alt tech. There's either one, pure alt tech, no using big tech platforms whatsoever, and uh, that a lot of people do fall into that category. Many prolific users of places like Minds or Gab or any of those sorts of other places do fall into that category. You also have the sort of mixture where you use both alt tech and mainstream tech, and I would certainly fall into that category, as I still put up stuff on YouTube and sometimes uh, reply to people on Twitter because I am a glutton for, uh, for pain, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's not good. <laughs> it, it, being on Twitter is not great, but, you know, I still use these platforms, but I have an alt tech presence. Most of what I actually post generally goes up on mine, so it's not as though I'm, you know, on big tech almost exclusively. And, you know, and speaking of which, you also have the last f uh, train of thought, which is big tech is the answer. Alternatives won't work. All uh, Big tech all the way, just go there and that sort of thing. And to start with, before we get into dissecting any of these claims or any, or, or any of these sorts of strategies, I want to dispense with a lie. And this is a lie that has been proffered by many a media organization, but also by many on the right, for a very long time. And that is the myth of right-wing platforms. Because, let's be honest, Minds, Gab, Parler, those aren't right-wing platforms. These, these platforms do not judge people on ideological content whatsoever. To put a finer point on this, I went through all of these platforms, uh, community guidelines, uh, their uh, terms of service, that sort of stuff. I went through it, and I broke it down essentially into this with Parler. Don't break the law. Don't spam. Tag your posts correctly. With Minds. Don't break the law. Don't spam. Tag your posts correctly. With Gab. Don't break the law. Don't spam, no porn. And Gab is the most right-wing version of this. On places like BitChute, to go into more of the video sharing aspect of this, on BitChute, you pretty much are free to do whatever you want so long as you don't violate UK law. Now, that sort of causes certain problems because UK law is stupid and doesn't have free speech protections almost at all, and anything that can be considered grossly offensive, which is a very subjective terminology and is judged by judges over there, is illegal. <laughs> you can't post things like memes over there if they're considered offensive by people, even if they are posted privately in private chats. No kidding, by the way. But that's the sort of thing you get with regard to many of these platforms. Almost every single alt tech platform I've ever seen. It essentially comes down to do not break the law, because if you break the law, then we go down too, you know. And if we leave you up there, then, of course, they go down. Uh, don't spam, because spam is simply annoying and it's bad for infrastructure and that sort of stuff. And for places where they have things like, not say for work tags or things like that, tag your post correctly. That's it. That's all it is. Those aren't ideologically motivated. I, I don't know where exactly we are getting into the ideologically motivated part of this, where the right-wingerness comes into it. But compare that to a place like Twitter, where they explicitly ban things like offense. They, uh, they will ban you for being offensive, for doing all these sorts of things, you know, uh, for being racist, for being homophobic, for whatever it might be. They ban you for being transphobic. So if you call someone by their biological pronouns, if they disagree with that, well then... You're gone on Twitter. That's how that works. Now, let me ask you, which one is ideological? Which one is intent on removing people because of their viewpoints? Is it these supposed right-wing platforms like Gab or Minds? Or is it the supposed neutral platform of Twitter? Let's be honest. It's Twitter. Because Gab is not right-wing Twitter, all right? Twitter is left-wing gab. Let's be 
entirely clear. Gab is the one without ideological commitment. It is the one that doesn't ban people because of their ideology. Most of these platforms have a very short, very clear, and very understandable community guidelines and, and terms of service. Whereas Twitter is long and vague and has many, many rules. It looks much, much more like an actual government uh, set of laws. It looks like actual legal code as, as opposed to the very simple and clean rules of a place like Gab, Parler, or Minds. They're very clear as opposed to Twitter. So don't let people get away with the lie that the big tech platforms are somehow the uh, ideological neutral versions of things like Gab and uh, BitChute, you know, in comparison to those right-wing Nazi platforms. It, it, utter absurdity. Utter absurdity. And that leads us back into the strategies. Because I'm not going to begrudge you for using alt tech exclusively uh, obviously if you're ha uh, obviously i'm not i like alt tech and i would suggest to those who aren't willing to put in the time to uh, have a presence on all of these sorts of platforms to actually do that just post on one of your whatever your favorite alt tech platform is and do that that's all you need to do for people who you know, have the time and are willing to invest in it, I really do suggest you do the multi thing. Because the more you can drag people away from these platforms and let people know about the alternative platforms, the better it's going to be when these people are inevitably banned and forced to choose. Because then they'll actually know there was an alternative to begin with, rather than tr uh, continually trying to go to that one platform in an attempt, vainly, to actually accomplish anything. For those who are intent on using big tech exclusively, generally I see the uh, mindset of that being that, well, alt tech isn't big enough, well, oh, it's an echo chamber because there aren't enough lefties on it or whatnot. I want to go through the fight. I want to fight on Twitter with the valiant Twitter battles that commonly happen and such. Well, uh... I know that anyone who has ever wasted time arguing politics on any big tech platform ever will know that that argument is simple nonsense. It simply lacks any form of content. It, it lacks any sort of credibility because Twitter, guess what, is an echo chamber. It is a left-wing echo chamber because every rule is slanted in their favor. It is also a left-wing echo chamber because the left makes up a much larger proportion of Twitter than it does the actual population. On Twitter, progressives make up something like a majority of the people on Twitter. The people are actually active, of course, whereas the right makes up something like 30%. That doesn't represent actual population any more than Minds does, or any more than Gab does. It really doesn't. It's not true that Twitter is somehow the unbiased platform, or the one that isn't an echo chamber. Because here's the fact of the matter, especially about something like Twitter. With Twitter, most of the way that you're going through your feed, and the most of the way that you're actually exploring the platform, is scrolling through your timeline. And guess what your timeline is? It's an echo chamber. You don't see anything on there that you haven't already explicitly told the platform to give you, uh, uh, barring the occasional advertisement. Other than that, you are seeing only what you want to see. If you don't want to see something, gone. No more. It doesn't have to exist anymore. You can f unfollow them. You can block them. And if you, it, no matter what you want to do, that's how that can work on any platform. That's how it works on Minds. That's how it works on Gab. That's how it works on T Parler. That's how it works on many of these microblogging platforms where the main way of l scrolling through, your, uh, through, uh, through it and in engaging with it is through your timeline, is through who you are already following, who you are already interacting with. All of these places are echo chambers. And it's not as though you're going to get any use out of infecting these echo chambers or uh, bouncing off of them, which would be a more accurate summation of what generally happens on Twitter. 
most of the time it's just you bounce off it you can't converse with them for a while you get literally nothing done regardless of whether you actually won the argument or not and then everyone goes away uh, believing the exact same things they believed before uh, believed before and no one else saw it <laughs> and no one else changed their mind because that's kind of how twitter works i hate to break it to you but that's what the situation is uh, moving on though to our last story the Biden White House is preparing a $3 trillion spending package to tackle climate change infrastructure and provide free community college and reduce inequality. Ooh, boy. Yeah, this is going to be fun, especially when it's coming right after they're uh, proposing the first tax hike in quite a long time. Ooh, boy. And by the way, they're actually going back on that whole oh, we're not going to raise taxes on anyone over $400,000, which, of course, was always nonsense because they were going to allow the Trump tax cuts to expire anyway, which is going to raise the taxes of almost everyone except certain people in the 1%, ironically enough. You know, particularly the 1% who live in California because of how certain exemptions worked. It removed certain exemptions you could take from state taxes on federal tax forms, and they, that's also going to be uh, done away with, which, yeah, real fun. Uh, <laughs> That's kind of the situation we're in right now. And they're doing this $3 trillion spectating package, which is essentially just, oh, we're doing uh, a bunch of debt or a bunch of inflation. Woohoo! $3 trillion. That's just something we can throw around now. You know, after we did a $1.9 trillion spending package, just barely, and we did another $1.9 trillion spending package only a few months before that, and before that we have almost $2 trillion, you know, we'll just keep spending trillions of dollars like it's nothing. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll spend $2 trillion the same way a five-year-old spends literally a dollar. That would be quite fun. Ah, oh, man. And much of this is in all likelihood not going to go into what their stated priorities are, because there's no way you get to $3 trillion based on just what they did. Well, possibly. They, they, they're making community college free, which, okay, whatever. Not something I particularly like. Also, they're doing infrastructure. We're doing construction of roads, probably all, almost entirely in New York and California, because that's all they care about in these sorts of cases. <laughs> That's the sort of places that get a lot of infrastructure money, by the way. They don't really spend it out to many of the smaller states because they don't have as much, you know, actual ability to do this sort of stuff. Also, no way you get to $3 trillion, even if you try to uh, to uh, rebuild the entirety of America. Uh, Trump's original uh, in infrastructure package back in 2016 was only a trillion dollars, and that was actually much more focused on, on infrastructure. And this... Ugh, it just irks me. This this whole package irks me because tr uh, uh, inflation's already completely out of control, and I don't want it to get worse. But it's looking like it will, so that's fun. But it's also a lot of fun for my uh, cryptocurrency wallets because, hey, those are gonna retain their value, aren't they? Huh? I'm gonna really enjoy that watching those numbers go up, and that's gonna be fun. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's all for now, and. Uh, if you like that video, do, in fact, subscribe down below, no matter where you are. But if you're on a platform that you don't like or on a terrible platform like YouTube, well, there's links down in the description, very, very pretty links down in the description that send you to the other places where I have a presence, whether that be uh, my bit shoot, whether it be my Odyssey, Brineon, my Minds, Parlor, and Gab for my thoughts and all that sort of stuff. I would also suggest you check out all of those very good places. And, well, that's all. I'm Cal Kidman, this has been Breaking on the Daily, and I'm out.